this bill. And so as a reminder to our listeners, you should have this programmed into your phone already. But if you don't, 202-224-3121. Absolutely. You should call your senators, you know, especially if you can call and give them personal stories about how this is going to affect your own life. That's always a good idea. Or your your parent or your spouse or your kid or, you know, whomever who is going to be affected by this. And and also, I'll just add to that, I hear this a lot. I, I see this a lot on Twitter. If you're in a blue state, People take for granted that their senator is going to vote, you know, against, you know, this kind of a bill. And in most instances, they're right. But the important lesson that we've learned from the ACA is it's really the volume of calls that that made the difference. And here's the clincher is that we want a huge volume of calls because we never, ever, ever want this to come up again. We never want to see any sort of reform to the American Disabilities Act. This thing has been around for 28 years. Businesses had 28 years to comply with the uh, enforcement of the American Disabilities Act, and that's unfortunate big part of of this reform, even though it's phrased in a, in a very like uh, positive way. So it is important to call, and I, I and it did my heart good when I called my own senators, Gillibrand and Schumer today, and I spoke out against you know this, and they told me that I, I asked them if they were receiving a lot of calls, and both offices did tell me that they were receiving a lot of calls. So that's what we need to do. We all need to call. And honestly, like you said, have that number programmed in your mind. It's probably the only number that I can remember personally at this point. And secondly, the other thing is that it literally takes two minutes to do it. It, it, it so easy. And even if you don't want to say, you know, even if you don't know anyone, or if you don't want to talk about it, you could just say, I don't want my senator to vote for this. And that's all you have to say. And they will count that as a no, and they will count it as something, as long as you mention the bill, the HR 620, they'll count it as a a no, and, and it'll count towards the volume of calls. So it's that simple. And I think that one thing that people don't think about with something like the ADA, you know, it's easy to think, well, this doesn't affect me. I don't need this kind of access. But as someone who's spent a lot of time over the past few years pushing strollers around, I can tell you (laughs) that... that some things about universal design are are really important and are taken for granted by people who don't need them for their own physical disabilities. You know, I really notice if I'm pushing a stroller around what places are easily accessible and which are not in a way that I never really paid a lot of attention to before that. Yeah. So I think it's really, it's better for everybody. I mean, I, of course, think it's extremely important, even if it affects only a small portion of the population. But it doesn't only affect a small portion of the population. And disability, physical disability is something that could affect anyone. You may not have a physical disability today, but maybe you will next year. Maybe you will for a limited amount of time. You'll break your leg, you know, maybe at some point you'll be older and you'll need a wheelchair. So it's it's something that's so important. Obviously, I'm talking only in this specific instance about things like ramps and things, but obviously there's a whole lot more to the ADA. But That's a very valid point. I mean, to my, I could speak to my own experience. It's, it, it'll, you know, next month, it'll be 11 years since I became disabled. And I was a healthy, active member of society, and I had a series of events that have rendered me disabled. And 11 years ago, I never would have thought that I would be sitting here speaking to you about this. So it it happened so fast, and I've accepted it, and, you know, it's part of my life. 
it doesn't define me, but it is part of me. And I understand the importance and I appreciate how important access is. And there's so many further implications of it because it, it, it has to it has to do with access and you know I'm not really good when it comes to really speaking about with the uh, legalese but I'm way out of my realm and my comfort zone but going back to the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964 I mean this all ties together and it it basically it's like if you have a thread on a jacket and you keep pulling at it and then all of a sudden like you pull at it too much and the whole thread comes apart. I mean, it's kind of like what they're doing. It's like they're pulling on that thread and basically trying to unravel everything and, and there's so many distractions going on. There's so many things being spoken about because it's this unfortunate incident of gun violence, of constant gun violence and there are so many attacks on like the environment and just it like we just can't keep up with all of these the environment rollbacks and oh my goodness just so many things that we're fighting that people are overwhelmed and that's why i mostly focus on healthcare you know when i first came to twitter which is only a little over a year ago now i was trying to get behind everything. And I realized that healthcare is my life and it is, I manage my care. I have 17 doctors that I see regularly. So it, if I'm not on Twitter, I'm at my doctors. If I'm not in DC, I'm at my doctors. I mean, that's my life. I'm either home at my doctors or I'm in DC. But here's the thing, you have, you know, if you don't focus on healthcare, that's fine. I think it's great to focus on one or two things and make that your passion and become an expert in that and become a, you know, and you don't even have it to be like a staunch advocate or a leader in something. You can do what you can, but if you do nothing, then things are going to happen. And we're just not at that point. And I don't think we ever will be again, where we can just be complacent and think that things are going to be taken care of. We have to learn to empower ourselves because it is our voices that make the difference. And if we use our voices, they're so strong and so powerful, and there's no way that they're going to get away with any of these legislation that they're trying to pull. But again, there's just so many of these things, it's so easy to get overwhelmed. But there's so many good people out there, I have to say, that are fighting each of these issues. And I'm so grateful to to see so many of them. I mean, there's another one I just thought of, DACA. There's a great one. You know, there's so many wonderful people that are that are fighting for that. And that's not my area of expertise, but I, I support it. I support it when I can. And people support me in healthcare when they can. And that's how we do it. It's like we, it's a very symbiotic relationship. And that's how we have to, we have to all work together. You know, there's no us versus them. It's like all of us have to work together. Yeah, I agree. And if you can't decide what particular issue to focus on, you become a podcast host and get to talk about all of them. (laughs) And it's wonderful. And I think, and what you're doing is wonderful because you're giving a huge, humongous voice to people like myself and amplifying it where people can sit and listen to it and think about it and hopefully it resonates or something resonates with one of your podcasts and with these people that are listening to you and your guests and it it might inspire them to do something that they may not have thought of before as well so it's that's a wonderful thing Well, I hope, if nothing else, that my listeners will remember to call the Senate. I'm going to say it again, 202-224-3121. Peter, I don't want to keep you too long. I know you're still sort of getting over your trip, covering from it. Is there anything else you want to make sure that that we talk about, about, about the trip or any conversations that you had? 
there's some really wonderful legislation that I spoke to, like, for instance, Senator Kane's office in Virginia, he is putting together some really great uh, legislation to give some long-term solutions to the Affordable Care Act. He's trying to come up with a Medicare alternative that you can actually buy through the ACA marketplace. And there, there are a few of these in uh, different senators are coming up with, and they're trying to implement them through their states, which would only enhance the Affordable Care Act, and they wouldn't actually have to be legislated through Congress and the Senate, only to be, because if it, if it miraculously got through Congress and the Senate, then I believe our president would probably veto it. So if you can implement it on a state level, you can put it in that state. And if it works for one state, you know, another state will use it. So these would only enhance the pulls in the Affordable Care Act, and it would just strengthen it, even though our president's done everything to try to sabotage the Affordable Care Act. So this would be enhancing it. And I did speak to every single office and ask them if they supported stabilization of the Affordable Care Act. And I have to say most of these offices did, and most of these offices are very concerned about their constituents which is a wonderful thing. The Stabilization Act is a short-term solution because premiums and deductibles have, you know, gotten a little bit out of control. But I've also heard, and I can't say who is working on this at this moment, but I also did hear that there is an affordability bill that's being worked on and that would reduce premiums and deductibles. And that would be an incredible, wonderful thing to, you know, people with deductibles of, you know, several thousand dollars would be reduced slashed in half or even in some cases even further than that. So there are some really wonderful things that I did learn from this trip, some really horrifying things that I learned from this trip, but I'd rather let's keep it positive. Let's keep it positive. Let's say having choice on the ACA marketplace is a good thing, especially if it does enhance the uh, Affordable Care Act. Having a more affordable plan is a great thing. So those are two incredible things I learned from this trip and made the whole trip worth it. Well, that's great. And I am so, so grateful that you go on these trips and that you really, I, I know that it must be harder than you're letting on physically to, to do it. And so I am so grateful that you do that and that you, you go and represent other people as well. You know, I know you've asked people on Twitter to send you stories and, and that you collect those and bring those with you when you go. And so I just, I think that's really incredible. Let me, let me say this, which is like what I'm, I'm really glad that you said that because this is what I also wanted to say before. You asked me earlier, how is it that I'm able with, I suffer from lupus and lupus is an autoimmune disorder and one of the biggest symptoms of lupus is fatigue. And I do suffer from a lot of fatigue. And when people reach out to me and they share their stories with me, it energizes me. It really does. I can't explain it, but it energizes me and it gives me that extra kick to like be able to get on a train at 3.25 in the morning and go to D.C. and have 13 meetings in a day and then wake up the next day and have 13 more meetings. But it really does because being a patient advocate has given me a whole new sense of purpose. I was a person who was very private, who kept, you know, his illnesses to himself and only my closest friends and family knew and some of my friends didn't even know about my lupus, about my kidney cancer. I am a kidney cancer survivor. 
some people didn't know. Some people found out through Twitter. Some people didn't appreciate that, but it's okay. But when I go to D.C., I realize it's a huge responsibility representing people, but it's also I realize that there's so many people out 